the tempo going into the fall and into the early winter, I imagine it still was pretty busy. Because I would like, if you're willing to, I'd like to talk about December 27th. Okay, yeah. Uh, first of all, at the end of uh, about the 15th of October, there was a cessation of any bombing in North Vietnam. We stopped going north. <clears throat> and uh, in the diplomatic side of it, they were talking about, you know, a peace initiative or something. Looking back at it now, I'm, I'm starting to think maybe it was sort of like a uh, October surprise type of thing for the politicians in the United States because the North Vietnamese were not anywhere going to do a peace initiative. And right. So we were sitting there and just basically flying missions in the south and relatively low threat, you know. Uh, and sometimes we'd do what they call barrier caps. You'd fly up into uh, Laos and just as a two ship and just act as like a barrier cap because there'd be a C-130 up there that has got a, we call them buffalo hunters is the name of the mission, but it had a drone on its wing that it would let loose and it would fly through North Vietnam and take pictures. And uh, then they would recover it out in the Gulf of Tonkin. But uh, you just basically fly around in circles and when the when the 130's mission was over, they'd say, okay, you can go home. And so you'd, you know, as the flight goes, you had a lot of extra fuel and guys would just do air training and things like that over over Laos, or they would do it, you know, in uh, in northern Thailand. While we do it, and it was a uh, one time in November. Uh, we got a call. We were airborne for some reason. It wasn't a barrier cap. We were coming back in mid morning, and we got a call. That said, "Hey, uh, they've got the." Uh, you know, the, the rescue helicopters up and stuff. And uh, they asked if, if if we could go over and, and cap for it. And we couldn't because we were down on fuel. And they had not, they had plenty of flights around. So turns out two guys coming back from uh, from a barrier cap had decided to, in the triple nickel, had decided to do some BFM training. And they got into the the fight and doing the training and, and broke through the bottom of the altitude they had reached. And lead had about a 60 degrees nose down, you know, going through about 8,000 feet. And, you know, his wingman said, pull out, you know. And the airplane did a massive pull out and then departed about 1,000 feet above the ground and they both went in. Oh, man. I, I lost a classmate in that. A guy named Bud Hargrove. Uh, Tibbetts was a guy in the front. Both together, those guys had two MiGs. You know, no kidding. Um, as a crew. Yeah. What a loss. You know, it's a crazy thing. Uh, coming back on another uh, mission a little bit earlier in the, in the fall, we had a lot of extra fuel and uh, barrier. The, the bar cap was gone. Uh, and we asked... Uh, Brigham, who was our air traffic control guy, you know, told him we were, you know, we wanted some airspace up above. I, my front seater was doing this. He and the wingman had worked out what they were going to do. And he just said, hey, we're going to go fast for a little bit. You weren't allowed to go supersonic in Thailand. And I said, okay. <laughs> and so he, he unloads, two unloads, lights the burners. And they accelerate, and they slip through the mock in about 1.3, and we still had tanks on. I'm going, golly. But the problem that really worried me is we're heading right toward the Thai border. Yeah, I said, hey, you know, we can't go into Thailand supersonic. He says, we won't. And he started his nose up. And I looked over, and there goes two. He's coming up with us, you know, about 6,000 feet out. And uh, I saw some pretty dark sky that morning. And 
I saw I saw fifty three thousand feet on the, the altimeter, and I pulled the front seater. I said, "You know, if we lose pressurization, poof." That's it. And uh, he said, "Don't touch anything. The engines haven't flamed out yet, and they never did." He, he gently took them out of afterburner once he knew we were in ballistic, but uh, we just went drop back straight down. We must have dropped two or three thousand feet just coming straight down with the tail and then it swung back and did this nice swing. It seemed like forever. And I looked over, two was doing the same thing. We came back. Oh my gosh. I thought you sit down, you yeah, you know, brief, debrief. I, I was the first lieutenant, you know, I was like, wow. I said that was high. Goes, yeah. yeah, that was cool, wasn't it? I go, mm, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on your definition it's, of cool. It was cool now, you know. Yeah. But, uh, so that's when I learned. I sort of learned that adage that that I've used in the back of my mind all my life. It's just, it's. Uh, how would you explain that to the accident board? You know, and that's it sits there. That's it. I, I start, I think the more experience you get, and especially when you get put in these scenarios, um, I always envisioning how the accident report is going to start to read, yeah. you know, and it's like at any one of these points, someone could have stopped this chain reaction that would have prevented this mishap from happening. Um, and I think it's just, yeah, as you get a few more laps under your belt, you start realizing like, mm, is it? And, and as you point to these stories, the Air Force, there's a lot of things you can't do. And I think it's lessons learned in blood. Yeah. A lot of the stuff, you know, combat sorties today, if you are drop everything and the jet's clean, like you're probably not going to go do BFM because you haven't done BFM in four months. You know, you're going to wait till you get home and everyone's going to kind of go through a requalification training, you know, to kind of do it right so you don't, put a jet out of control or do something. You know, ideally you don't put a jet out of control. Well, they codified everything in, in the BFM training later on, as I went back through in the front seat and went through the various training scenarios and, and the things I they realized that the BFM training was killing a lot of guys. There were people in Spain that were killed, you know, cause the guy didn't call, you know, he, he called disengage, you know, and that's when the whole air force said, Hey, from now on, the terminology is knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Because disengaged sounds like I'm engaged. And, yep. you know, the guy lost him in the sun, and the next thing he had a mouthful of airplane. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, so coming into uh, into December, we were all kind of sitting there going, I wonder what's going on. Uh, and then on the 16th, there was a briefing. Selected group of people uh, went in, had their briefings and stuff, and then you know came out, and they weren't allowed to talk about what was going to happen. And uh, it's okay, but uh, I decided I'd go over to the chapel that night. It was packed. The chapel was packed, and uh, I knew what was going on, and uh, talked to. Uh, good friend of Wizzle of mine that was on the first strike in with the B-52s and stuff. And uh, I was on the next strike in the next night going in. So through those, oh, what, it was about nine days before I was shot down, I was flying uh, the night strikes going in until I had to abort on one. And uh, that put me into a cycle to go into the day strike just on crew rest. And yeah. they were, you know, they were loading everything they had on every airplane they had. You know, some guys were going up into North Vietnam with one heat missile and one functioning radar missile. You know, because everything else was already loaded on the airplanes, all the other airplanes and stuff. And uh, that's war. I'm sure the Russians are finding that out. Yeah. You know, but the uh, the day I was shot down was the uh, 27th of December. And 
we took off out of Udor and the, the mission was to uh, escort, a four-ship escort of F-4s for 24 A-7s that were going up to hit a target to the, it was actually to the northwest of Hanoi, about 11 to 15 miles out of Hanoi. It was an intelligence complex center that they wanted to hit. Well, I thought it was strange because the A-7s carry A-9s on them, and even if they have bombs, they can defend themselves pretty well. But yeah. so we were up there, and it was uh, we we took off from Udon and waited for the uh, A-7s to check in, and we waited for two hours. And then the A-7s came up on the radio, said they weren't going to go to the tanker, just to meet them at the, you know, there's a geographic point that we had, the, the fish's mouth is what it was called, and just meet them there, and the tankers were going to drop us off there, and meet them there, and we'd go into the target. And so that worked out, joined up, and here you've got these, you know, you've got six, four ships, the A-7s. As a matter of fact, I think what they had is four six ships is what they were flying in. And uh, they were just heading in and, you know, we <laughs> we checked in on frequency and we could hear the, the beacon going off. Some, like, some American somewhere had, you know, been shot down and headed on in uh, about, you know, five minutes toward Hanoi. The uh, the Red Crown called lead and asked if uh, he could split up his flight because he's got MIG activity north of Hanoi and he wanted to use lead in two and leave us to escort. So we did that and we split off, split up as a loose deuce group now rather than the four ship. And uh, lead in two went off to do whatever they could help Red Crown with. And we watched the A7s go in and hit the target. And it was, I know the flight lead was the first one to roll in. And I could see that the target, it was almost like a, a fortress complex. <clears throat> and he rolled in and his bombs were about a mile and a half long. <laughs> and I remember saying, man, I thought those A7s could bomb. But Two through twenty-four, put them right down the smokestack. They dug a hole. <laughs> now, I'd say they dug a hole in China, but China was right there. They, uh, right. They were, they were trying to go home with it. I guess it was amazing <laughs> to watch. And we we covered them as they came off, and swept back around, basically heading. We were the plan was to head toward the east and then turn back around and then head uh, two seven zero out of the theater and back to Udorn. Uh, Udorn was a heading of 210. But 270 would get us back with the A7s and we'd all leave happily ever after. And we had just turned to the east and I looked down and it, it was cl cloudy, not overcast, but splotchy cloudy. I looked down and saw a MiG-21 below us, very fast, going out in front of us. And I called it out to, to uh, a front seater, and he saw it and made a call, you know, to, to to four at the time. He said, hey, stick with us. We're engaged. We got abandoned or whatever. And he, he rolled over on him, and by then I had a radar lock on him. And for some reason, the lock kept breaking, you know. And a front seater said, Switch the red crown frequency. We've got to get clearance to fire. Because with all the airplanes up there, the ROE was, you know, combat tree and a visual and clearance from red crown. Two of those three you had to have. Okay. <clears throat> you know, we only had one right now. And so I went to that frequency and he called them and asked them if they had any bandits airborne. And they said no. And... I'm sitting there saying, I got a full system lock and it would break and it would break. And, it, and yeah. what I thought he was doing was auto acting it on the throttle to try and put it in the pipper. 
Okay. <clears throat> and I was later on in prison, I was really angry at him because I said, you know, <laughs> I had him locked up, you know. But it dawns on me now that, you know, they have pods too. And I think probably the the uh, the MIG was trying to, you know, whatever defensive electronics it had was trying to steal the range gate on it. And, you know, I'll just give him that benefit. <clears throat> but then he goes, I lost sight. You know? And that was one that just goes, uh-oh. So he started a hard climbing left turn to the south so we could then come back around and get out. And uh, and during this time, we realized we still had our center line tank on. Two had already gotten rid of his. So if we were going to tangle up anymore, we need to get rid of the center line tank. And so we did that. And I thought the tank came off hard. I, you know, it came off harder than any tank I've ever felt come off. But we, we unloaded and started to accelerate out. And uh, <clears throat> about the time, it was probably about a minute and a half, there was a controlling agency disco on an EC-121 that was monitoring communications. And they put out on guard, basically, heads up, bandits attacking, bullseye, said 220 at 23. And I looked down and we were at about 225 or 2230 at about 30. And I just went, oh, man. I said, come hard right. And just as we started a hard right in burner, uh, we got hit. Boom. Yeah. Going through 16.5 at 490 true. <clears throat> and uh, instant negative Gs. And the plane was doing, I don't think it was fully fully rolling over or what, but I, uh, <clears throat> I tried to get my hand on the handle down in between my legs, and I was plastered on the top of the canopy already. And I got down, and, and it pulled, and I, went, I was gone. I don't think it was an accident. I think I decided that I'm going to go. I talked with my front seater later, and he said, well, you were a little early. But <clears throat> I, I figured out that when I went out in the airplane, I was actually blasted down because the plane was inverted. And then when the drogue shoot right in my seat, the plane caught up with me. And it missed me by about 100 feet over on my, my right side. And I could see the back oh, end kidding. of it burning and everything like that. And I watched that. And I just sat in the seat. And I heard the, the aerostatic timer going off. And then the chute opened up and pulled me out. And... Uh, I checked the chute, made sure it was good, and I looked down again, and I saw my airplane impact, you know, and blow up. <clears throat> Everything was really quiet, you know, except for the wind. And uh, I looked around at my level, and I didn't see any parachutes. And that really, that made an impact on me. And uh, I looked down, and, I, and I, then I did see a parachute down probably probably about 4,000 feet from me and it was going down fast and had a, had a panel torn out of it and that was my front seater and uh, he was he wasn't fat but he's a big man he's six foot two and when he went out at 490 true the uh, he took quite a shot as a matter of fact with him he had one of those uh uh Commercial made helmets that they were making back okay. then uh, for guys to get because they were better than the, the flimsy military ones. And he had the pull down visor, and his visor had split down the middle, okay, had peeled off this way and, and cut circles underneath his eye. Oh. They, yeah. they weren't really, they weren't deep enough for stitches and stuff. But 
you know, when he recovered from getting yanked pretty hard and he looked down, he's got blood here. He can't see because he's got blood in his eyes, you know, and uh, oh. it was it was a tough time. Uh, but we were out and we we're both alive, but I wouldn't see him for another eight hours or so after we both captured. The guy. How close did you guys land? Oh, we were a couple miles apart. Yeah. Okay. And it was, it was, uh, he was captured as soon as he hit the ground. Uh, okay. I managed to uh, make a four line cut and I was looking around. I could hear something and I couldn't tell what it was. And, and I did make a radio call to an F4 I saw flying around. I assumed it was number four. Okay. Later on, it turned out it wasn't. It was somebody else. But, uh, I checked for, you know, my equipment, my pistol that I'd had strapped on my side. It, it left me when the chute opened. And uh, the water bottles that I'd had in my G-suit pockets, those were gone. And uh, I looked down. I was still probably about 5,000 feet above the ground. And I looked down. And I, I was coming right down in the village. And... They, I could see the puff of smoke that they were shooting at me. So I didn't think they were going to be able to hit me. But I thought it wasn't time to come down in the village. So I, I went ahead and, and did a slip with my chute and, and managed to get it over near the ridge lines and clear the ridge. And then I could see the ground coming up. And I just put my knees together as tight as I could. And I put my arms up and I put my visor down and I just looked out at the horizon. I was waiting for that tree impact, you know, that I was going to clobber or I was going to hit some rocky piece of karst that was sticking up. And the branches started swishing around and I came to a nice gentle stop, you know, hanging in the chute. And I put out my right foot and touched the ground. 